Justin Seward, who is a member of our church here, a, uni a student at University of Pennsylvania, and has recently been on his uh, journey to the Middle East, and he's going to tell us about it today. Thanks, Justin. Yeah. Um, so my name is Justin Seward. I know everyone here. Um, <laughs> I'm a senior at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I got uh, involved uh, with a lot of the stuff regarding Israel and Palestine um, because it was happening on my campus. Um, and uh, I'm a student leader. I run the interfaith uh, group on campus, uh, which means I run dinners and uh, holidays and stuff that people do together. Um, so uh, that goes anything from Diwali uh, to Holi to uh, uh, Ramadan dinners to Shabbat dinners, stuff like that. Um, and so I was uh, selected by so many administrators at my university to go to Israel. So this is what the talk is about. Um, this talk is not necessarily about uh, the religious stuff going on um, in Israel, uh, obviously a very important place. It's about the political uh, landscape and the conflict going on now. So this is a little roadmap. Um, I'm gonna talk about my experience a lot. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about uh, some data and some solutions that uh, people commonly talk about. And then we have 15 plus minutes to, to discuss and have any questions and if I can answer them. So this is just an overview. Um, I was there from May 21st to the 31st. I turned 21 on the 22nd of May. Um, it's not super exciting when you go to Israel where you can drink at 18. Um, <laughs> and um, so the trip uh, was funded by the Maccabee Task Force. Maccabee Task Force is a conservative uh, think tank and lobbying group. Um, and they run a lot of trips like this to Israel um, for students at elite universities uh, to influence um, uh, power, you know, political power, economic power, uh, business stuff in the future. Um, so I stayed in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Um, there was 10 Penn students uh, and 10 Cornell students. Um, and they select this, this is a national organization. So students from across the, the country, from all these big universities, uh, went as well, but we, uh, our 20 of us, uh, stayed together. Um, it was organized by the Penn Hillel, uh, which is the Jewish Life Organization. Uh, it's the largest Jewish life organization uh, on college campuses in the world. Um, and then the, the purpose of the trip was just about uh, perspectives. That's what it was called, the organization is called. Um, the idea is that we were getting to get the perspectives uh, on both sides of the conflict, or all sides of the conflict, or however you want to think about it. Uh, we were going to get perspective. Um, so that's the overview, and we're going to go into the context of uh, what I was coming from and what I, what I had known. Um, so this is my campus. This is the middle campus, um, and this is a protest going on right here. Um, you can see there's Palestinian flags, there's Israeli flags, um, there's people everywhere, people going to class. This, I was on my way to class, and I took this picture, um, and it was like this for months. Um, where the whole campus was uh, embroiled uh, in uh, protest. Um, and what they were protesting for wasn't always very clear. <laughs> um, this was the day that the encampment uh, went up. Um, this is in the middle of the encampments starting to going up. I'm sure you've heard about the encampments where people put up tents and literally stayed on the college greens. Um, started at Columbia University. I was there last week um, at Columbia and uh, then it kind of rolled down into the other universities, including mine. Um, eventually, the encampments were dispersed by police and people were arrested. At Penn, 33 students were arrested. Um, I was called very early in the morning um, to open up the church on campus for sanctuary uh, for people who were fleeing the police or in need of uh, any spiritual care. So uh, let's see if I can play this little bit of video. So this is just the morning. This is seven o'clock in the morning on a Friday. Um, these are professors being arrested. This was at the church I had opened up. Um, and this is the aftermath of the police arresting everyone. Um, so this is, this is what I knew. This is what I was coming into. Um, I had known that the popular stuff that was going on uh, around the world uh, on these college campuses. So to begin the, for the talk about the trip, I got some terminology because there's a lot going on. This is the other side of the world. 
Um, so I want to give you some context of you know where we're talking about uh, and who we're talking about. So the Gaza Strip, you probably heard about this one. Um, it is the, the thin strip of land between Israel, Egypt, um, and the Mediterranean Sea. And it is where the, the bombardment is happening currently that you've probably seen on the news. Um, the Gaza Envelope is the whole region, it's a low-lying uh, region along the sea. The Gaza City is the Gaza Strip's largest and northernmost city. Um, I visited uh, just two miles outside of it. We'll see pictures. Khan Yunis is another city in the middle, and Rafa is the southernmost city that borders Egypt. It uh, has the, the um, entrance to Egypt there, too. You probably heard about that. The Negev is the desert in the southwest Israel, but the whole region is kind of called the Negev. And then uh, kibbutz, or kibbutzim for plural, um, are the small agricultural communes um, that were started in the 1920s that are all kind of uh, down there in the southwest. A lot of them were attacked on October 7th. Tel Aviv and Jerusalem are the two cities. Jerusalem is the sort of the really, really important one. Uh, it's really uh, old. A lot of people are Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Jewish, that is. And um, <clears throat> Tel Aviv is the sort of like the modern uh, tech heavy place uh, where a lot of the young people go to. So this is the map. So this is all of Israel. And we have the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and Israel sort of in the middle. Over here, you can see the, the three major cities. This is my first experience getting into Israel. I, this is uh, President Herzog's uh, house. I drove right past it, going to my hotel on the, uh, when we arrived. Um, and there's armed security all along the streets. And there's uh, bars and uh, bulletproof glass everywhere. This is the site of the Nova Massacre. Um, this is where a music festival was happening and uh, 300 plus uh, lives were lost as well as um, an unknown amount of uh, captives were taken um, on October 7th. This is one of the kibbutz. Um, this is just north of the Gaza Strip. Um, it, it literally borders it. Um, and there's some interesting things going on here. So the entrance is this, is to this compound essentially is all um, barbed wire and razor wire. Um, you had to go to the security checkpoints to even get close to it. Um, these are the air raid sirens uh, for when rockets are fired. Um, and this is a false roof for when missiles strike. Um, it hits the false roof and explodes on top of the building instead of in the building. Um, so the whole infrastructure of the area is desi designed around conflict. Um, this kibbutz, uh, over 50 people died. Um, and it was sort of horrifying to see because you'd walk around uh, the houses and there'd be no one left. <laughs> there was a few people around. Uh, most of the people who survived were evacuated, uh, but it was essentially a ghost town. This is a bomb shelter. You'll find these all over uh, Israel entirely. Like every, every place, uh, every bus stop has one of these bomb shelters. It's a concrete structure. Um, that uh, sometimes has doors, sometimes doesn't. Um, that is for when you're outside and all of a sudden you hear the air raid sirens uh, and you can't go into the bomb shelter that is in your house. Every single house in Israel has a bomb shelter uh, as long as it's built post 1950. Um, so it, the, like I said, the entire place is built around conflict. So this bomb shelter was in the same kibbutz, um, and an 80-year-old woman was hiding in here when uh, October 7th at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, Parasailers flew over the wall uh, in the Gaza Strip and landed in their community, and they shot her here. Uh, there's a little memorial going, um, uh, but they did this all throughout the countryside. Um, they found these bomb shelters for people hiding in because they were outside taking a morning jog or walk or whatever and they uh, raided them. In the same kibbutz, there's this wall. This wall uh, it literally says path to peace in three languages, English, uh, Arabic, and Hebrew, which are the three predominant languages in Israel. And uh, this kibbutz that was attacked was known for being a peace-loving and uh, peace-advocating uh, place. Uh, it was, <laughs> it's a commune, literally, so they all uh, peace-loving communists, um, and so uh, the contrast between like this, this wall, uh, which was built by 
uh, Gazans and the people of the kibbutz together uh, towards peace uh, were attacked by Hamas. And just below, beyond this wall is uh, the actual um, structure that uh, keeps people in Gaza in Gaza. So first you have this layer, it's an electrified fence uh, with razor wire and barbed wire along it. And there's motion sensors all along it. So um, if you even get close, people will know you're there. And there's cameras um, on these poles everywhere. So the whole thing is extremely monitored. This concrete wall is for um, small arms fire. So you can't fire directly into the kibbutz. Um, as well as rocket fire. That can be anything that shoots straight. And this is where I left the kibbutz, walked about half a mile, mile, and I went up on top of a hill and I was looking into the Gaza Strip. This is the border right here, running down along here. And these were artillery shells coming down and hitting. There's one over here, one over here, and one over here. And I watched them all hit. Um, it was extreme. So I went from seeing the devastation in the kibbutz to walking over to this hilltop and looking into Gaza City and seeing extreme destruction. Um, I, I didn't see a single intact building. And as I was like listening to the boom of the artillery shell hitting, uh, it, you can't help but think about who was impacted by that uh, strike. And the strike just kept on coming. Um, all along the, the uh, down here towards Khan Yunis um, and Rafa, this is the south over here, uh, there were artillery shells I could hear. I couldn't see them, they're so far away. Um, I'm this is looking about two miles to the center city of Gaza City. Uh, so it was just an incredible sight. Um, this is me looking through a pair of binoculars. This is the middle of Gaza City. Uh, this is what once a uh, dense urban center um, that is complete rubble. Um, a few months ago, uh, a geographer from uh, Oregon State University uh, calculated that about 75% um, of buildings were destroyed. Um, that was a few months ago. I would expect it's probably about 90% now. Um, so there's really nothing left. Every single place you go in Israel, you'll see the Israeli flag. It has the Star of David, there's two blue lines. And it is everywhere. It's on every single pole, it's on every single structure, building, whatever. You'll find it everywhere. Um, a huge amount of people would just have them on their cars uh, as they were driving down the highway. Um, and you'd expect that around election season in the United States, but not usually not an election, you know, or like something else going on. Um, I have never been in a place that was more nationalistic. I think I've seen more Israeli flags in my life being here for 10 days than I've seen American flags in my lifetime. Um, I've seen hundreds of thousands at this point. Um, I've never seen so many. This is in Starot. Starot is about two miles outside of Gaza City. Um, and this is a, a group of IDF soldiers. IDF is the Israeli Defense Force. They're all about 18 to 21. So I was on the older uh, side of that range. Um, and I was probably older than most people here. Um, and they're preparing to go into Rafa for the Rafa incursion uh, that happened in May. Uh, they were going to destroy the tunnels that Hamas had dug underneath um, the Egyptian border. That was how they were smuggling supplies in. Uh, so I was told by the intelligence officials. <laughs> um, and this is some of the rockets that were fire fired into Stiro. Um, they collected them as like trophies. And I, they were actually extremely proud to show that they had these rockets uh, because they knew that like the, the rockets uh, may have been fired, but they did not overcome them. Uh, so it was, it was a little odd to see these mangled pieces of metal and they were like, yeah, this is, this is like what keeps us fighting. Um, and along with the, um, these like pieces of infrastructure, um, weird pieces of military equipment, uh, they would all use um, as places to gain favor, to um, draw support, nationalistic support uh, for the military and for the government. So this is a uh, big billboard. It's huge. Uh, this is also in Stirot. Um It's the same place where the IDF soldiers were standing. 
And it is uh, the site of uh, a police headquarters that was attacked on October 7th. And they have this big billboard and it says a memorial will be established on this site in English uh, as well as in Hebrew. And I was just like, it has been like eight months since this happened and there's fighting two miles away. And this is what they're focused on. Um, that's because they're really, really concerned about national support. Um, there's a lot of anti-government protests happening. A lot of people nas like internationally are concerned about the ethics of what's going on in, in uh, the Gaza Strip. And so I thought this was really uh, a fascinating feature. So I'll move on to uh, in Jerusalem. So this is the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, the Temple of the Mount, the Dome of the Rock, lots of different names. Uh, it is the place where in the Bible, you've heard uh, about the, the temple um, where Jesus you know, chased out the money lenders or the money changers. Um, happened right here, like uh, this, is, this is the temple. Um, the holiest of holies used to be over here in the middle um, somewhere, uh, no one really knows. Uh, so uh, this is the place, uh, all of it happened. And um, right now stands the Dome of the Rock. Uh, it is a big building with a gold dome. Dome with a chain, dome with the ascension. Um, this is the place that in Islam, uh, they say that the prophet Muhammad uh, ascended into heaven. It is the third most holy site in Islam. Uh, the first most holiest site, Judaism. Um, and somewhere it's pretty holy for us uh, uh, Christians, uh, if you are a Christian in this room. Um, so uh, kind of interesting, um, but uh, Jordan actually controls the whole compound. Um, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque is down here um, as a site of huge uh, Muslim uh, pilgrimage. And it is the most contentious, uh, maybe two acres of land in the world. Um, there is, there, there's, this is the, the crux of the East versus West debates. Um, this is the crux of the modern Hamas versus Israel uh, conflict. This is uh, what the issue is. When you ask an Israeli, what are you fighting for? They'll point to Jerusalem and say, I'm fighting for that. When you ask a Muslim, what are you fighting for? They'll point to Jerusalem and point towards the Dome of the Rock. Um, this is the, the, the point of conflict. And uh, you'll find Christian, Jew, Jewish, um, Muslim pilgrim programs all trying to come to this one little spot. And it's controlled by uh, Jordanian forces, the Jordanian Authority, uh, as well as uh, IDF helps them out. They have somewhat of an agreement. Um, a lot of people recognize that it is such a contentious place, so they uh, guard it very heavily. So you walk around the holiest place in the whole world, and all of a sudden you'll, you know, watch a whole bunch of uh, IDF soldiers with big machine guns walk by. Uh, it's extreme uh, contrast. So this is the Dome of the Rock. It's a really beautiful building. Um, it was built by a Muslim caliphate um, about uh, 1,100 years ago. So it's one of the oldest buildings um, in existence in such a pristine condition. Um, and you can see it all throughout Jerusalem. It's extremely high up on the big rock in Jerusalem, <laughs> and uh, its dome uh, peaks down above all the buildings. This is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It was originally a crusader uh, temple, um, but now it's the, the, the place for uh, when prayer happens for uh, Muslims. Um, any other religious group cannot pray or do any sort of religious ceremony in the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. Um, you will be arrested uh, and you will be, uh, if you're American, deported. <laughs> um, there was a huge uh, issue um, in the uh, second intifada in uh, 2002. Um, the prime minister at the time um, went up to the Temple Mount, prayed, he was Jewish, and um, it caused essentially the second intifada. <laughs> um, and so like there, there's nothing quite as uh, more significant than um, praying uh, as a non-Muslim here in this uh, Temple Mount. On the grounds, there is the last king of Palestine, that's what this says. Um, and a lot of Muslims will point to this, this is the, his tomb, um, as they're saying that like, well, Palestine has always existed, um, which uh, uh, is sort of a debate on whether 
uh, Palestine has a right to exist, whether Israel has a right to exist. Um, people always say, uh, well, who has actually controlled the land, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so they have this uh, last king of uh, Palestine uh, entombed right next to the Dome of the Rock. Uh, the flags I find interestingly are actually like, they're modern, they're modern flags. Um, <laughs> they're only from like the 1920s, whereas he's from like the, uh, the 1700s. Um, so they had like went in afterwards, changed the flags um, to make a political message for the, the modern day. This is the Western Wall. Um, you probably heard about it. It's also known as the Wailing Wall. Um, down here is where Jews will pray. Um, a lot of Jews will find it uncomfortable to be in the compound itself. They can't pray up there anyways, um, but they find that uh, if they trespass where the holiest of holies used to be, it is the same as uh, trespassing it like it was in the Bible, which would be um, death or destruction of some capacity. Um, I want to point out this picture that this is the only gate that uh, non-Muslims are allowed to use. There are um, uh, 12 gates uh, going into the compound, um, but the only one that they allowed uh, others to use is this one that's high up of the air. Um, it is literally over top of the place where they pray. Um, so they had to build this big bridge uh, in order to even up, get up there. Um, so. Uh, there's a lot of politics to like how they allow other people to go up there. So have a look in the city. Uh, you have the, the wall here again, um, Dome of the Rock, and the mosque is over here. This is from Lag Borum. Lag Borum is a uh, Israeli festival. It's Jewish in nature, but it's uh, very Israeli. And it is essentially um, during their, you know, um, uh, to make an analogy, month of Lent, um, it is their one day that they're allowed to celebrate. So everyone gets married on uh, Log Borum or proposes or um, anything that you need to do that's happy, you do it on Log Borum. Um, so this is a festival that I, I got to see while I was there. Um, these are all ultra Orthodox, uh, which is a um, sect of Judaism that uh, tries to rekindle their like. Um, way of life that they had in the shtetls uh, of uh, Eastern Europe. So they all wear um, heavy woolen clothing uh, with uh, heavy wool hats um, that would have been uh, best suited for uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Ukraine or uh, Romania, places like that um, in the wintertime. So it's very weird to see in the middle of the Middle East um, people wearing such heavy clothing. This is um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is where uh, Jesus was supposedly uh, entombed. This is supposed to be his tomb, um, according to tradition. This is a picture of the Catholic Church that's inside. There's 11 different churches inside. It's very confusing. Um, Old City Jerusalem is not like any city you've ever seen, um, unless you've been there. <laughs> uh, it is uh, all connected buildings. Um, so each, each building is connected to the one next to it. And you kind of walk um, through the buildings uh, is how the streets work. Um, so there's actually no outside of the building to show. Uh, I, was, I was trying to figure out how to <laughs> demonstrate it uh, for the presentation. Um, this is the place where the, um, Jesus was supposedly crucified on the cross, um, the place where uh, the Roman soldiers cast lots for his clothing. Um, and this is right next to um, the compound. Uh, so the, the religious nature of the conflict um, is the most important uh, part of the conflict. Uh, it's something that really can't be overlooked. Um, and I, that's why I wanted to really bring that up. Um, this is just another picture of, the, of, of Jerusalem. Uh, you have these side streets um, and you have the, sort of the main avenues uh, where people sell things. This is the Muslim quarter. And everywhere in the Muslim quarter, you'll see uh, armed guards, IDF soldiers, and police. Um, and you'll see them on the corners, and they're usually behind like a metal gate of some sort, and they'll be holding their guns, and every now and then they'll stop and frisk someone. Um, I witnessed this several times while I was there, and I wasn't there uh, in Old City Jerusalem for that long. Um, one of the, the students who was Muslim from uh, Cornell was stopped and frisked. Um, once they realized he was American, they let him go. 
um, but they, they were picking out specifically people who looked uh, like they were Muslim. This is the Sea of Galilee. Um, I was really interested in it because, you know, the uh, religious context in uh, Christianity. Um, while I was looking out, uh, right over here on the side was um, where the Mount, uh, Sermon on the Mount was. It was, you know, a really interesting, cool place to be. Uh, you know, I was looking out and soaring overhead, screaming was uh, um, F-16s. Um, they were going to intercept rockets shot from Hezbollah um, over the Lebanon border. Um, and so it really, uh, just like uh, walking around the Dome of the Rock, we're seeing the soldiers uh, march by, uh, took me out of the place uh, and made sure I realized that I was in a modern situation. Um, so uh, this is up close to the sea, um, really just a fascinating place to be. So this is Tel Aviv. Um, Tel Aviv is a modern city. Recently, there was a drone attack that killed one person um, sent by the Houthis in uh, Yemen. Um, that was actually like right over here. And I'm where we're kind of like perspective-wise, where we're coming from, where the picture is taken from, is Jaffa. And in Jaffa, um, this is where I, I was able to purchase one of these. If I've seen these around, uh, or protesters have had them on, this is a kafia. A kafia is a like traditional cloth that um, is worn by um, people from this region. And it's known for being lightweight uh, and good at uh, breathing or breathable uh, material. Uh, so people wear it on their face a lot. Um, I purchased this here in Jaffa. Jaffa is a historically extremely Muslim uh, place, although it has like had like 25 different occupiers over time, uh, beginning with the Phoenicians. The, the city of Tel Aviv, the full name is Tel Aviv Jaffa, um, and it's named actually after Jaffa, which is just a different way of pronouncing it. Um, and this is one of the contentious sites uh, where Muslims will fight over this, saying, this is where we belong, uh, but they were forced out during the Nakba, which happened in 1948. Um, it was the expulsion of uh, Muslim Palestinians from the land. I, was, I didn't take this picture. Um, one of the other people in that group took this picture. It is a uh, anti-government protest. Um, it's not a like stop the war protest. It's a we don't like uh, Netanyahu protest. Um, and you can see that they're, they're holding Israeli flags. Um, like I said, it's an extremely nationalistic country. So they are going to be patriotic. They're going to uh, think they're fighting for their country, uh, fighting for their values. And they want Netanyahu out. He's extremely unpopular. Um, and the sort of, uh, he, he was unpopular even before this, this war started, but now people are saying he's even uh, worse as a leader because um, he failed to, to retrieve the hostages. Um, they say it's been too long, uh, that there's too many opportunities for the hostages to come back, um, yet they're not. So it was a sort of an interesting thing to see. Um, Netanyahu controls the uh, election cycle. So he decides when the next elections are held. And when the next elections are held, he will be voted out immediately. <laughs> and there's plenty of much better people who will replace him, um, but he'll be indicted and he will almost certainly be imprisoned uh, because he's been so corrupt. Um, so here's some graffiti. Um, BB is Netanyahu's um, nickname. And this is an interesting one. Um, it was back when uh, President Biden was still uh, in the running um, for uh, this next election. election. Um, so dear presidents, dear presidents, the screams of our babies, children, women, men, and elderly who were murdered, slaughtered, raped, and burned alive are calling you from the ashes no more. And I found it interesting that like, why in the middle of Israel are they appealing to President Biden. <laughs> uh, this is just on a random street uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, it doesn't quite make sense why uh, they're appealing to President Biden. Um, a lot of uh, Israelis are also American citizens, uh, but not that many. Um, however, when you think about who is sending them money, who is defending them militarily, um, who is their strongest ally, it's going to be America in every case. Um, so sort of a sort of who they are as a people, um, really defined by American culture. Everyone there speaks English. Um, 
you can even spend American money there in most places. Um, they listen to American music. Uh, culturally, they are uh, extremely American. Even when they speak Hebrew, um, many of them speak in American accents uh, because they were born in America or they have family from America. Um, a, just a, the, the connection to America is extremely strong. This is some graffiti. Um, uh, Herschel was a teenager, he was 19, uh, who was taken hostage. Um, he was eventually released, uh, but uh, this is on a street in Tel Aviv, some little back street. Um, but uh, even like, the, the think of the people who are making graffiti are the people who are caring about this. Um, so when I say like, it's everyone, everyone's extremely nationalistic, everyone's involved in this fight, it is everyone. Um, and it's not whether you are involved, it's uh, what your position is um, on the involvement. This one's uh, pretty cool too. This is a huge mural on the side of an apartment complex. Um, so Superman, he says, don't panic. And then down here, it's a little cut off, but uh, the IDF protects us. Uh, obviously Superman is panicking um, because he trusted in the IDF. Um, so they don't like Netanyahu, um, primarily because they blame him uh, for not getting the hostages back and for failing to prevent October 7th from happening in the first place. And so um, that disapproval painted on every building, just like this. I also was able to speak to um, people in the West Bank. Um, so this is Khalil Shikaki and Amal Jadu. Khalil is a professor of sociology and statistics. Um, so I study sociology, this is, we were able to speak the same language. Um, and he gave us a lot of data, I'll present in a moment. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, his brother uh, was uh, Fathi Shikaki, um, who founded the Palestinian uh, Islamic Jihad, uh, which is a terrorist organization. Um, so I was able to, over virtual though, uh, speak to, um, people who are really connected to the terrorist organizations in the West Bank. Um, as far as anyone knows, Khalil is not involved in that. Um, he's really disowned his uh, brother who founded that organization. His brother was killed in the 90s over it. Um, but he was able to give really, really solid um, data on public opinion uh, in the West Bank and in Gaza on the conflict. Amal Jadu is the Palestinian uh, foreign minister. And she spoke uh, the but the, but the most opinions, uh, she, she had really wanted to get us, persuade us uh, to think a certain way about um, specifically people in the West Bank, but all Palestinians as well together. Um, she went to Harvard um, for graduate school and she had her whole education in America. So she was um, uh, talking to Penn students, Cornell students, students were all on the same level. She was speaking out uh, uh, in terms that I knew from my sociology classes, she was talking about, um, uh, you know, extre like, like really high level theory um, that I, I was like a little taken aback by, but she knew she was talking to college students and she knew college students were taking these kind of classes. Um, so she was really able to like um, appeal to us. I thought that was kind of um, interesting. She's sort of like a PR person of uh, public relations. Um, she uh, was really concerned about the settlements, um, the settlements uh, in the West Bank by Jewish settlers. Um, there was a right of return in Israel where a, a, a Jew in Israel wants to move to the West Bank. They can, um, and the state of Israel will support them uh, with you know, some exceptions, but uh, by and large, they can move really wherever they want um, and they can claim the land. Uh, this is like what makes everyone furious they can say, I want this parcel of land. It is my birthright. Uh, I have you know, the, the ability to take this land. Um, and I want it for myself. And they can claim it. And the IDF will protect them. Uh, that no one can, uh, the people who are kicked off that land, who had maintained that land for however many generations, whatever, it doesn't matter. So she said, that is the, that is the issue uh, for people in the West Bank. They don't like the settlements. Um, I, I don't know if I disagree with her, <laughs> um, the, the way she, she described the settlements. Um, the, the politics in the West Bank are really interesting. We'll talk about that in a moment. So we're gonna get into some data now. I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, 
This is a graph uh, showing the humanitarian conditions in the Gaza Strip. Um, so this is where the war is happening. Um, it has two dates. So the first one was done on March 24th. The second one was done on June 24th. So it shows change over time. So the first question is, do you have food sufficient for a day or two? Uh, in America, every single person would say yes, for context. Uh, in March, 44% um, of Palestinians in Gaza said they had enough food. Um, so that's like starvation level. Um, on June, you see 64%. So uh, there's clearly aid getting in there. Um, not enough, but clearly some aid getting in uh, that uh, people have enough food. Um, and then uh, can you uh, get aid um, if you, or, or food if you need it um, with uh, great risk or difficulty? Um, so yes, you can get it um, without much risk. Um, Yes, but with a lot of risk uh, is extremely high. Um, so most people are able to find this aid if they need it, the food, the water, the, the, the um, medical aid, um, and a very small fraction within the margin of error says no. <clears throat> For um, has a family member been killed during the current war, 60% um, of people say yes, that has not changed. Sort of interesting thing um, over the course of the war, uh, you would think that more people would say yes. Um, so that might say something about the actual death toll. We don't really know. Um, has any member of your family been injured during the current war uh, between 68 and 65, um, which is also pretty consistent. Um, but if you think about it, that's like almost 70% uh, of the population of the Gaza Strip uh, has had someone uh, severely injured, perhaps. Um, same thing happens with um, any family member killed or injured over the entire course of your life? Um, and uh, almost 80% of people have said yes. So uh, if you think about why, why is Gaza Strip so militarized? Why is it so, um, why has Hamas been able to take over? Why has extremist Islamist ideology been able to take over? Um, the answer might lie in, well, maybe it's because people are being killed. Um, and then more people are being killed, more people are being wounded. Um, when a ch child sees their father being uh, blown up, um, I think it's pretty reasonable to say, well, that could be a cause of this war. So this talks about the politics. So if it was up to you, which of these would you prefer to see in the control of the Gaza Strip? Um, overwhelmingly, it's Hamas. Hamas is the terrorist organization that is backed by Iran. Um, it is uh, the, the perpetrators of October 7th. Uh, it has been in control of the Gaza Strip since 2006. They were elected in 2006. In 2007, they uh, performed a violent military coup um, and they overthrew uh, all the governing body um, and they uh, took place, uh, the Palestinian Authority that was controlling them. Um, think about it like our entire United States government being overthrown and replaced by a different government, essentially what happened. Um, and they've not held elections since 2006. So Hamas is not democratically elected. Um, they are a dictatorship. Um, but Hamas is seen as uh, a military fighting force. Um, whether they're ethical or not isn't really in the question. A lot of people don't know what, this, what they're doing. And there's a lot of misinformation. So um, you see the people who are most uh, uh, close to Hamas uh, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, Hamas has not controlled the West Bank. Um, so the Gaza Strip is the lowest. Um, so you have blue is total, uh, orange is the West Bank, and gray is the Gaza Strip. So the gray is quite low, that's because the Gaza Strip knows Hamas. They know who they are, they know um, what they're doing. Um, they also know that they're the ones begetting the destruction, um, that they're the ones who uh, has started October 7th. And um, the West Bank, who doesn't know Hamas, uh, likes them a lot better. They don't know who they are. This is where it gets interesting um, with who they like people-wise. So Moran Bagudi is a uh, Palestinian uh, West Bank person, uh, politician, who was imprisoned after his crimes in the second intifada. Um, and he's wildly popular, everyone loves him. Um, so if they could get him out of jail, they'd have him. 
Um, but uh, who is in control right now is Mahmoud Abbas. Mahmoud Abbas is like 86, he's extremely old, he's frail. Um, everyone knows he's gonna die pretty soon. Um, and he's uh, just like Netanyahu, he's the one who controls the election cycle. So no one gets elected next, no one replaces him until he says it's time. Um, he'll probably die before that happens. Um, Abbas is sort of a controversial figure. figure. People like him because he's like uh, prevented Hamas from taking over. Uh, he's prevented these other extremist groups from taking over. Um, however, he's extremely corrupt. He lives in a big mansion on top of a hill uh, with lots of security uh, and he has lots of food. He's very plump. Um, and so uh, he's in a place where 60% of people are in extreme poverty, uh, where they don't have enough water. Um, they don't like him. Uh, but what can they do about them? They don't live in a democracy. Um, and this other person is Ismail Hania. Ismail um, grew in favor. Uh, you can see uh, the change in dates here. So it gets uh, this is earliest, this is latest, earliest, latest. So Gaza Strip, um, he has been pretty consistent, um, consistently popular um, in the West Bank. He has gained popularity uh, very, pretty extremely by 10% or so. Um, so uh, even now though, people will prefer Bargudi over him. Ismail, though, is out of the running. He was killed uh, last week, two weeks ago, I guess, at this point. Um, he was killed by uh, uh, supposedly an Israeli um, secret agent who planted a bomb two months prior to his visit uh, in Tehran, and uh, he blew him up, uh, as well as his security guard. Um, so Ismail Haniya is not uh, in the running anymore, I guess you would say. <laughs> um, So it's up to you, would you have a boss, uh, leader of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank resign? Um, everyone says yes. People in the Gaza Strip say yes, people in the West Bank say yes. Um, the West Bank, uh, it's actually sort of, uh, it's 94%, which is the highest. Uh, it's actually very close to the margin of error. So it could literally be 100%. Um, and the um, Gaza Strip is sort of interesting. They, uh, as time has gone on, they've, uh, sort of like flip-flopped up and down whether they like him. Um, it's probably because of the uh, politics with Hamas, whether Hamas um, uh, has been you know, winning the war, losing the war, um, who do they wanna see come in power next? Politically, um, who do you support? Fatah is the Palestinian Authority currently. Um, it is uh, Abbas. Hamas um, would be Ismail Hania, but he, he's no longer. Uh, and you have some third parties uh, and people who are sort of unaffiliated. Um, this is the, the unaffiliated don't know or do not answer uh, is actually pretty consistent with the United States. Um, people who don't vote or don't care about politics, um, which find it kind of weird for being a war-torn uh, country. Um, but uh, who do the people support? Um, Gaza Strip. Um, about a quarter of people pretty consistently support Fatah. Uh, and so they would uh, prefer to have the Palestinian Authority replace Hamas. Um, overwhelmingly though, people still support Hamas. Um, and then uh, we have the West Bank. And the West Bank, um, in the beginning, um, pre-October 7th, they really liked Fatah, sort of. Um, much, much more than they liked Hamas, at least. Um, and then uh, October 7th happened, and they've liked Fatah less and less, and they've liked Hamas more and more. Um, you do see a sort of decline though. Um, uh, just post October 7th, people really liked uh, Hamas because they thought it was a uh, uprising, that they're finally coming back, um, that this was the, the liberation that they've been uh, waiting for. Um, as that has become clear, that's not happening. Uh, they've, uh, the support has declined pretty, pretty steadily. So what do you want to happen? So you have this conflict. Um, you as a Palestinian have been living under occupation, a military occupation. You have not had uh, citizenship of any country. You've not been able to leave. There are no airports in your country. You couldn't leave if you wanted to. Um, you can't um, have a business and import items. Uh, you can't um, do business outside of uh, Palestine. Uh, you can't travel to Israel um, because you are barred by very large walls. Um, what do you want to happen? Um, I would say 
with all that in mind, negotiations um, have been around a quarter um, for uh, what people want to happen, 25% roughly, um, consistently actually. Um, and so like the peaceful ne negotiation um, of what's gonna happen um, has been consistent, hasn't really fallen uh, away. Um, I think that actually just points towards like, um, not everyone uh, here is uh, um, violent and they don't want violence. They've seen enough violence. Um, then you have peaceful popular resistance, uh, which is like uh, peaceful de demonstrations. That has risen and fallen a little bit more. It hovers around 20%. Um, just uh, post October 7th, you see here in West Bank, um, people don't think that's gonna happen anymore. Um, as time went on, they realized that's probably uh, not true. Largest though, around 50% all across the board is armed struggle. Um, so that is this sort of uprising that they thought Hamas was bringing to them on October 7th. Um, so uh, I think it's a, it's a little bit discouraging to see. Um, although there are a lot of uh, uh, peace activists I've talked to. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, uh, all that came from um, uh, uh, Khalil uh, Shikaki. Um, he does this public opinion research. So you can look him up online if you wanted to. Um, so here's some statistics that uh, Khalil uh, has gathered. Um, over 60% of Gazans report losing family members in the current war. Two thirds of the public supports, uh, uh, of pub public supports uh, the October 7th attack. 80% uh, believe the attack put the Palestinian issue at the center of global t attention. I think it's probably pretty true. Half of Gazans expect Hamas to win the war and return to rule Gaza. Um, this I think is quite up in the air. We don't know quite what's gonna happen with that. 90% wants President Abbas to resign. They don't like Abbas or Fatah. Um, support for a two-state solution has dropped significantly in the Gaza Strip, more than 60% supporting the dissolution of the PA, which is the Palestinian Authority. Um, so the, the two-state solution is something that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but the dissolution of the PA is interesting because that essentially means Hamas. They would prefer Hamas or a... Um, uh, so the, the Oslo Accords in 1994, uh, 1995, um, established the Palestinian Authority um, and it was a two-state solution-esque um, thing. And uh, so they kind of like want to shirk the Oslo Accords uh, and start afresh. This is another person I talked to, uh, Mohammed Dawash. This is where he lives. Um, this is Ixel. Uh, and uh, this is a Palestinian village within uh, Israel proper. So not in the West Bank, not in Gaza. This is um, in Israel. Um, it's a Palestinian visit village, so they're all Muslim, um, uh, like 98% of them. Um, and this is one of the examples of internal apartheid. Um, so this idea of apartheid is uh, pretty popular. Um, uh, we, it kind of rekindles the idea of uh, South African apartheid uh, between uh, the, the different racial groups. Um, people accuse Israel of having the same thing. Um, so this is a Palestinian village. Right next door is a Jewish village. Um, the Palestinians, um, about 45% of them, are living in poverty. Uh, whereas about 20% of the Jewish uh, neighboring city uh, lives in poverty. Um, the people here who work in this city work, um, they go to the Jewish city and they uh, work there. They work as janitors and, um, you know, uh, service workers and whatever else, uh, the low lying, lying low skill uh, jobs. Um, so I talked to this uh, Mohammed Darash, and he uh, is a council member who runs this city. Um, so I was over here. This is the council building. Um, and we talked to Mohammed, and he uh, is a peace activist. He uh, um, has worked a lot to improve the economic conditions of Palestinians in Israel, as well as uh, work towards solutions to the Palestinian uh, conflict uh, within the, the nation. Um, so 20% of Israel proper is Palestinian Arab. So, um, so a fifth of all of Israel, uh, Israel proper, um, so not West Bank, not Gaza, is Arab, uh, they're Palestinians, um, which is a huge percentage um, uh, to for, where you think of a Jewish state to be. Um, and 45% of these Israeli Palestinians live uh, below the poverty line. 58% of Israeli Palestinian children live below the poverty line, um, whereas 20% of Israeli Jews uh, live below the poverty line. So the, the, the economic apartheid is extreme. 
Um, so you don't only have this physical barrier, uh, you know, different cities, uh, walls between Gaza uh, and Israel, walls between the West Bank and Israel. You also have um, extreme social disparity. Uh, before October 7th, um, trust between these groups hovered around 65, 75%. Um, you know, I trust you, you trust me. Um, pretty consistent. After it, um, trust for Palestinian Israelis fell to 34%. Um, so that's uh, these Palestinians who are living right next door to the, the Jews in the area. Um, Jews will say 34% uh, of them will be like, I, should, I trust my neighbor, um, which is extremely low. Uh, and then uh, sort of the inverse, um, trust for Jewish Israelis, um, so uh, Palestinian uh, living in Israel, 50% uh, of them will say, uh, I trust a Jew. 92% of Israelis live in segregated communities. Um, so the, the, the idea of a neighbor next door, it's not quite next door. Um, they live in the, uh, the same city sometimes, but in different sections. Uh, Palestinians can't uh, walk through the Jewish sector. Jews can walk into the Palestinian sector though. So I want to talk a little bit about the solutions. Uh, I kind of set up a big problem. There's a lot of issues here. Uh, we talked about apartheid. Uh, we talked about the war. We talked about um, the, the economic issues. Um, so these are things I, I feel like most people have heard in the news. Uh, so I just want to address all of them. Um, so number one is a ceasefire. Um, uh, one state solution, two state solution, uh, economic development and codependency, um, normalizing relations with Iran and other countries. Uh, the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, um, and the social contact theory. Um, so one way or another, you probably heard of all of these, although I've kind of like worded it my own way. So the ceasefire agreement. Um, 1,200 people were killed on October 7th. Uh, 250 people were taken uh, captive. 140 have been returned. 111 remain captive. Uh, 39 of those are dead. Uh, and 40,000 Palestinians uh, have died in Gaza uh, due to direct conflict, whereas um, up to 186,000 Palestinians could die from starvation, disease, and uh, other conflict-related morbidities um, uh, based on other recent conflicts in the Middle East, uh, like in Syria, as well as in Sudan. 1.4 million refugees in Gaza. So of the 2.2 million people in Gaza, 70% um, of them 1.4 million are refugees. That means they've been displaced. They're living in tents. Um, they likely don't have food to eat or water to drink that is clean. Um, it is a kind of a staggering number. Um, it's really unseen. No one's ever seen this much um, destruction of uh, infrastructure in the world. That's just that's never really happened. Um, there's, there's, there's not, like, even like the bombing of cities in World War II, not even come close to the numbers that we're seeing of refugees uh, in such a short amount of time. There are about 2 million refugees from Syria over a war that's been happening for 20 years. So um, 2 million Syrian refugees uh, for a war going 20 years. This war has been happening for now 10 months. Um, so 75% of the buildings destroyed in some areas in the Gaza Strip. We know that we saw the pictures of that earlier. Um, Hezbollah has been uh, shooting rockets and uh, drones from the north uh, in Lebanon um, into uh, Israel. So the entire north of Israel uh, is evacuated and no one is there. Um, Ismail Haniya was just assassinated. Um, and among all of this, all this conflict, all this death and destruction, um, people want a ceasefire. Um, and it's, I think, a like, very noble task to try to negotiate with people um, who've been through all of this uh, and who are so committed to this war. Uh, we saw all the flags, all the national symbols of Israel uh, fighting for their, their military rights to exist um, and uh, try to get them to calm down, <laughs> uh, to uh, stop uh, bombing uh, indiscriminately, to uh, pull out troops, to... Um, have Hamas sit down at a table. Um, it's even less likely that Hamas is interested in negotiating after uh, the leader has been killed. Um, the ceasefire is uh, extremely com complex. Um, there is a number of uh, proposed ceasefires that happened in the past. Um, then Yahoo so famously denied all of them. Um, uh, Hamas agreed to several of them. 
uh, but he, uh, being a very like uh, hard-minded person, he refused the agreements and he thought that his military could retrieve the hostages and end the war. Once the ceasefire happens, um, which it will likely happen eventually, um, it's unclear what will happen from there. Um, Israel has uh, not really accepted the uh, international helping hand that's the UN and others have offered. Um, and they have uh, uh, always sustained that they wanted to keep control of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Um, they're not interested in Jordan annexing the West Bank. They're not interested in uh, Egypt annexing the, the Gaza Strip. Um, in fact, offered uh, 40 years ago that Egypt uh, annex the Gaza Strip and govern it. Um, Egypt, who had just normalized relations with Israel, did not want to offend Israel, so they did not take the land. Um, so the ceasefire, um, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris just announced yesterday that she was working on a ceasefire agreement. That's, she, that's now part of her uh, campaign promise. Um, we'll see what happens with that. Um, the other idea um, that's been floating around is the one state solution. Um, this is a claim from me uh, that the, the current state of Israel is a one state solution. Um, and that's because uh, Israel controls the West Bank, Israel proper, and the Gaza Strip. Uh, they have full military control, and in some areas, they have full civil control. So uh, that means the, your government office, your post office is controlled by Israel, even though uh, you're paying taxes to the Palestinian Authority. It's not really, it doesn't really make sense. Um, and in uh, the entire state, uh, Israel can send in the military at any time. Um, so even if you have your own police force and you're trying to manage um, uh, your population on your own, uh, you have your self-governance, you want to be uh, sufficient, um, Israel can uh, step in uh, and take control and authority at any time. Um, so uh, that's, that's why I, I'm claiming this is essentially a one-state solution because Israel is the one state at the moment. Um, and uh, the one-state solution usually uh, proposes, uh, this is sort of like a, a, a solution to the conflict, that uh, a federal system will be the best system. So, um, so there's a one singular federal government, everyone votes for the president of that, and then there are uh, different states, just like the United States. Um, and that's the um, federal system might be a good way of uh, replacing what is going on now, that uh, people who are in West Bank and Gaza Strip aren't citizens, they have no citizenship. Um, people in Gaza are citizens of nowhere. They have no passports, they have no nothing. Um, <clears throat> sort of a critique of this, uh, the one-state solution is heavily critiqued. Uh, it's really not an option at all. Um, the only person who supports it is Netanyahu. Um, uh, that's like the sort of extreme conservatives in Israel who are afraid of um, losing power uh, or uh, being overtaken by the neighboring Muslim countries. Um, they look at these numbers, the population, there's you know 7.2 million Jews and there's uh, 7 million uh, Palestinian Arabs in the state. So that's West Bank, Gaza Strip and Israel. So they look at these numbers and they're like, well, if we have a one state solution that isn't you know, a reform of the current state, um, we're gonna be outnumbered. The, the, the Arabs have a much higher birth rate. Um, they are, they're gonna replace us very quickly um, and we're gonna lose power and we're no longer gonna have a Jewish state that we fought for. Um, it comes down to this, Israel is a homeland for Jewish people. If they're no longer the majority, no longer controlling the government, uh, they're surrounded by people who hate them, um, they're gonna lose that idea of a homeland. Um, they aren't gonna be protected. And this whole idea is overwhelmingly unpopular. Everyone sees these flaws. Um, although uh, the, the government in place in Israel right now, Netanyahu and his government, uh, his band of uh, conservative parties that he's brought together um, uh, fight for this solution, um, but no one likes it. Um, it doesn't satisfy anyone. Two state solution is uh, the much more liked one. <laughs> Uh, I support the two-state solution. It makes no sense. It satisfies everyone. Um, all it requires, though, uh, and this is sort of the, the big if, is that people stop killing each other. Um, and that, that means like the, the IDF has to 
get themselves out of the Gaza Strip. That means Hamas has to um, put down their weapons. Um, and then the, the citizens of both uh, uh, places have to uh, get along a little more amicably. Um, and that's why, that's a big critique of the two-state solution is that that's never gonna happen. Um, that the, the that sort of idea of peace is, is too much. Um, so that, that's the, the major critique of this, um, but it's still very popular despite that. Um, the Oslo Accords uh, attempted to create this, and that's when they created the Palestinian Authority uh, and the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, it failed miserably. Um, the, uh, there was no international support of these new countries. Um, these people have never lived under a democracy ever. And so uh, they had no idea how to do a democracy. And uh, there was no international support from Muslim countries or, or Western countries, or there, there was, they were on their own. And uh, Iran swept through. And Iran uh, is the one who backed Hamas. And that's how they got the Gaza Strip. Um, so it was really a failure at first, um, mostly because there wasn't enough investment um, uh, from other countries. Uh, this, this is what the big satisfying part is. There's two states for two peoples, and it re uh, retains the idea that Jews can have a homeland. Um, people will fight uh, for that idea of the homeland, uh, like nothing you've ever seen. Um, even, even Jews in the United States uh, will talk about Israel as their homeland. Um, during uh, the Passover, when you uh, finish Seder, you say, next year in Jerusalem. Um, and uh, so it's, it is the culture of Jews in the United States and in, uh, in Europe uh, and elsewhere um, that this Israel, even if they don't live there, is their home. Um, so that's just an important thing to, uh, to, to actually satisfy if you want peace um, is, is to succumb to that. Um, a lot of people don't like that idea that uh, Jews don't have a right to live in Israel. Um, I thought about that idea a lot. Uh, I'm not sure that it matters. <laughs> um, that uh, the peace is more important than uh, who has a right to be where. Um, that's my opinion. Um, a big thing under the two-state solution that people um, advocate for is the return of civil and military authority to Palestinians. So right now, the one-state solution that's kind of uh, occurring, um, Israel controls everything. Uh, they uh, control the tax system in uh, the West Bank. They control the military everywhere. Um, and that really uh, demoralizes the Palestinians. Uh, so we need to fix that. Um, we need to uh, get rid of the settlements. The settlements are extremely antagonistic. Everyone kind of recognizes that. Um, even uh, like most, a lot of countries have denounced uh, settlements. Um, even 20 years ago, people were denouncing settlements. Uh, in 2004, the United Methodist Church denounced settlements. Um, everyone really does not like settlements, uh, yet they still build them. Um, so. Uh, something needs to be happened, uh, figure out what the settlements, um, if they continue, uh, peace will not be possible, um, and they will likely have to be dismantled. Uh, and people who would live in the settlements, which are a couple hundred thousand at this point, will have to be removed uh, and returned to Israel. Um, I think that uh, the two-state solution for it to work efficiently, uh, there needs to be free travel and the right to work in both places, um, and that uh, there's a... Uh, two nationalities, um, there's Palestinian Arabs and there's uh, Jewish Israelis. They live under one country, uh, but there's two nations within that country. And it doesn't matter where you live, um, it is about uh, who you're born to that determines your nationality. Um, and that's uh, you know, your passport, if you're born to a Palestinian mother, your Palestinian passport. Um, and that's uh, this integration, um, especially economic integration is the, the key. Uh, to, to the piece of, of this solution. Um, economic uh, development and codependency is um, really the, an important piece of this. Um, there's a lack of jobs in Palestine um, because there's a huge embargo. So uh, the first step to a developing country is to uh, begin production, like, like uh, to produce goods. Um, in the United States, we live in a service economy. Uh, we, we provide services, um, so mostly software and stuff like that. That's what we do. It's all like, it's not tangible. It's not a good, a service. Um, the first step to developing an economy is to produce something that's tangible and that's good. Um, you think about like Bangladesh, Bangladesh produces clothing. Uh, and that's, that's their uh, step in development for the economy uh, to uh, 
you know, reduce profitability uh, to enter the world stage. Um, Palestine currently is not able to do that. And be, that's because Israel uh, does not allow them to export or import anything. Um, so they're really living in isolation. Um, <clears throat> there's a phenomenon called, phenomenon called a brain drain. Brain drain is when um, the successful people in a certain place um, are pulled away to a place where they can make more money. So in Palestine, uh, the really successful people, people go to the fancy universities who get the highest degrees, who are the, the best of the best and everything, they come to America and they aren't, they aren't returning that uh, production value, that, that change uh, potential to the place where they're from um, because they have better opportunity here. Uh, this happens at a lot of places, uh, but it's a, it's a pretty big factor uh, in what's happening there. Um, sort of a encouraging thing that's happening um, of Palestinian Israelis, so Palestinian citizens of Israel, um, there's, a, there's a huge portion of them in the medical field. Um, so 24% of them are doctors um, and 43% of young doctors who are just um, starting their practice uh, are Palestinian, um, <clears throat> which is, uh, a, they are filling um, a gap that is left by um, these uh, extremely observant Jews who can't um, work on the Sabbath. Um, so there's a, there's a big gap in, uh, also with blood, touching blood makes you impure uh, in Judaism. Um, so uh, working in the, the medical field is actually a, a, a big outlet for a lot of these Palestinians um, to find jobs. Um, so uh, it's kind of encouraging. It's a sign that's possible, at least, um, that like if you go to a doctor, doctor has authority over you. Um, they are someone that's there to support you. Uh, you look favorably upon doctors. Um, so it, it's, it's proof that's possible, at least. Um, <clears throat> another thing about um, economic development is the Gaza oil rights. Um, there's a huge oil field just off of the coast of the Mediterranean um, Sea where Gaza is um, that Israel currently controls and they um, extract oil from. Um, if uh, Gaza was allowed to uh, exploit those resources uh, instead of Israel, they would likely have a uh, better economy and more jobs and uh, all those things make happier citizens and happier citizens make less violence. <laughs> um, so that, that's a pretty important feature um, as well as agriculture. Mo most uh, farmers and uh, producers uh, in Israel are Palestinians. Um, it's because they owned the farms before Israel existed. <laughs> so they continued the, uh, to produce food and stuff like that. Um, and better integration and uh, a better uh, market for uh, agricultural products is really important. Um, traveling, uh, Palestinians are extremely restricted. Um, they, if you want to leave the country, you have to go through Israel. And to go through Israel, you have to be allowed to enter Israel. Um, and about 80% of Palestinians are not allowed to leave. Um, so they can't, uh, even when they apply for their permit to cross the border from the West Bank into Israel, uh, they, 80% uh, of them aren't allowed to. So opening up travel, uh, getting pal Palestine on the world stage, um, every, uh, getting tourism under Palestine instead of Israel. So places like Bethlehem, a huge place of pilgrimage in the world. Um, Bethlehem's in the West Bank, but Israel controls uh, how you get to Bethlehem. Um, and returning that to Palestine uh, is, is uh, also extremely important. Tourism being just a really big industry. Um, there was a airport in uh, the Gaza Strip in 2004. It was bombed during the Second Intifada. Um, so there has not been an airport in Palestine uh, for 20, 20 years. Um, so traveling is really important. Um, you might have heard this phrase, normalizing relations. It essentially means that uh, we as uh, two countries agree that we're not going to be antagonistic towards each other. And we're going to... Um, try to compromise, we're trying to make trade deals, we're going to um, reduce restrictions on travel, so you don't need a visa to come visit our country, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> it is a process of uh, reducing tension, essentially. So um, the normalized countries that are, are currently, uh, or normalized relations with countries, uh, Egypt, Jordan, uh, the UAE, uh, Bahrain, 
Morocco, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia. These are all the Muslim countries that are around Israel that have normalized relations. Um, Iran is the, the big player here who is not, and they're uh, explicitly antagonistic. Um, Saudi Arabia and the um, uh, Arabian Peninsula countries, so Oman, Yemen, um, and Iraq, uh, Kuwait, UAE, those countries are actually like extremely against Iran. They see Iran as an aggressor, they see Iran as backwards. Um, so they work pretty heavily with uh, Israel. Um, places like, uh, the, like the Jordan have shot down drones that have been sent from uh, Iran. So uh, a Muslim country of Jordan shooting down uh, drones is pretty significant. Um, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Houthis, they're all H names for whatever reason, uh, are all funded by Iran. Um, there's uh, religious politics behind this. So Iran is Shiite. Shia is a uh, uh, practice, a different practice in uh, Islam. It's Shia or Sunni. 90% uh, of the world uh, of, of uh, Muslims are Sunni Muslims. Um, and 10%, uh, which is mostly just Iran, are Shia Muslims. And Shia is a little bit more, it's a militaristic, militant um, form of Islam. Um, it was, it was uh, uh, developed by the Ayatollah of um, Iran um, 50 years ago. And uh, it is uh, to convert all these Sunni, <clears throat> Sunni Muslims um, to Shia Muslims. And <clears throat> Hezbollah, which is in Lebanon, so in the north, uh, is Shiite. Hamas is Sunni. Uh, and Houthis are Shiite. So Hezbollah <clears throat> is in the north. It's really, really well funded, much well better funded than um, Hamas is. Hamas, uh, I don't know if anyone's noticed, is being absolutely pummeled by Israel. Um, that's because Iran does not care about Hamas. They don't care about the Sunni uh, Muslims in Palestine. Um, Houthis, also very well funded in Yemen. <clears throat> They've been... Um, fighting the, the Yemeni uh, civil war um, is also backed by Iran. Um, so dealing with these organizations is an important step into normalizing relations with Iran. The boycotts, uh, divest, and sanction movements um, <clears throat> started uh, when countries and citizens were responding to South African apartheid. Um, and the idea is that uh, you boycott uh, uh, in this case, Israeli products and services divest from Israeli bonds, companies, and institutions, and sanction Israel through trade restrictions, military embargoes, and diplomatic isolation. So you'll see people do this all the time. They um, <clears throat> do boycotts uh, Israeli products. Um, so uh, kind of famously in Philadelphia, um, there was Goldie. Goldie is a, a bagel shop. And um, a protesters uh, so outside of it, picketed it and said, don't buy from here. This place supports Israel. Um, and uh, Governor Shapiro went there the day after and got himself a bagel. And <laughs> um, the uh, boycott movement has, has been a really big story in this, um, as well as the divestment. So the encampments have all been about divestment um, from Israeli bonds um, uh, and also in their companies. Um, <clears throat> or companies or products that are related to the conflict itself. Um, so uh, pertinent example is um, the University of Pennsylvania, my university, um, uh, has a, a lab that uh, provides for venture capitalists and entrepreneurs. And one of the uh, companies was Ghost Robotics. Ghost Robotics produces drones, um, so unmanned uh, uh, machines to uh, perform various tasks. Um, and they were used um, in the, by the IDF in Gaza Strip uh, to uh, walk into a building and blow it up. Um, and so the protesters at uh, my university were saying we need to divest from this company. Um, all companies that start at Penn uh, in our Penn Innovation Lab, uh, Penn owns 15% of their stock. Um, so. Uh, Divestment is, is a big thing. Uh, the United Methodist Church has divested from um, Israeli bonds and companies that were related to warfare, um, as well as the Presbyterian Church, Mennonite Church, and others. Um, 
Sanctioning is uh, what you hear, like who is petitioning the government. Um, so uh, the United States sends uh, military aid to uh, Israel, a lot of it, uh, $3.8 billion a year uh, and about $12.5 billion this year alone. So uh, we send missiles, we, sh we send, uh, we help with the Iron Dome um, and we, do, uh, we defend them essentially. Um, so military embargoes are really important. And the big thing, uh, this is the big exciting thing, I think. Um, how do we get people back together? Um, so this is, it's called the social contact theory. Um, <clears throat> and it's about uh, integration. Uh, so you integrate people um, back into society together. Um, so schools are sort of what people classically say is the most important feature. Um, Darwash, we uh, saw before, um, came up with this uh, three-point theory. Um, so you get people in contact with each other, you bring down the walls, uh, you get people working the same the jobs together, uh, you have people exposure, people in the same schools together. Um, so contact, you know each other. Exposure, uh, repeated, repeated exposure over and over again. It's not like you have dinner once together, you have dinner uh, once every week, or your whole life together. Um, and the third point, which is sort of unintuitive, is that you need people in a position of authority over you. Um, so you need your doctors to be Palestinian, you need to be your, your school teachers to be Palestinian, you need um, people in the government to be Palestinian, your police officers to be Palestinian, and you need integration. Um, you need uh, and it goes the same, it's Jewish and Palestinian people in authority over you. Um, and that's what really uh, solidifies uh, that my neighbor who lives in the, the sector of the city over there that uh, I can't even walk into is actually a person, is by seeing them as a person. So Israel receives the most aid from the United States, $300 billion over the course of Israel's existence. Um, all right, so these figures, $3.8 billion yearly to Israel, $12.5 billion since October 7th, so 10 months. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's been little economic aid, but huge boost in um, military aid. Uh, this is uh, the first Palestinian revolution um, in the war in 1976. That's when we sent more aid. And this is uh, the current view of uh, U.S. Americans by age group uh, on uh, sending aid to Israel. So young people do not want to send aid. 29% uh, of them say str strongly oppose aid. Older people, much more favorite, um, which I think really demonstrates, uh, comes full circle back to the college campuses and uh, who is protesting uh, and uh, who is sending aid. Um, so I'm going to leave these questions up here. Um, I'm going to open up now to questions and discussion. Uh, so if you want to know more, <clears throat> I can try to answer your questions. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about my experience some more. Um, I know a little bit of statistics if uh, you need some more context. Yeah? Um, it's unclear. Um, so the 40,000 uh, people who have been killed is a projection. Um, so no one really knows, no one's counting bodies. Um, and it's not that they're not counting bodies because they're inefficient or they're um, neglectful. Not counting bodies because there's no more hospitals left. <laughs> um, so they uh, estimate that uh, 12 to 19,000 um, of those 40,000 have been children. Yeah? Yeah, um, Netanyahu, um, who is the um, person who is aimed at these international court uh, proceedings, um, the ICC uh, is um, the International Court of Justice. Um, they uh, have marked Netanyahu, um, the prime minister of Israel, as uh, a wanted person. Uh, they want to bring him to justice, this him in court, um, so that's if he... Uh, leaves the country, he could be arrested by the ICC. Um, and uh, I, I 
I, I think that Netanyahu is probably not the greatest person. Um, so he uh, is probably a good, a good opportunity uh, to, to prove our, our international court system. I don't know. The, uh, is it extreme? Probably. Um, but uh, the, whole con the, whole, the whole situation is pretty extreme. Penny? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I have been around a lot of people who are uh, very pessimistic about uh, peace. They don't think people are uh, willing to put down their guns and their rockets um, to figure it out. Uh, and I think uh, I met a lot of people who were interested in that. Um, I met a, uh, a lot of Palestinians uh, and I met a lot of Israelis, Jews. Um, who are working towards peace in uh, Israel right now. Um, so uh, Mahmoud uh, Darwash, uh, who is up there, he uh, has opened 13 schools that focus on Palestinian and Israeli integration. Um, he has uh, founded a company that supports uh, uh, Palestinian uh, engineers. The engineering and tech field is the, is the biggest industry in Israel. And there's a... Um, discrimination, job discrimination. Um, so they are getting Palestinians into um, uh, the, tech, the tech field. Um, so like there are, there, there are like a lot of movements to um, uh, integrate their society um, and work towards peace. Um, the, <clears throat> I, I think that Netanyahu is the, the warmonger and that uh, when he is gone, they will likely find peace much faster. Um, and so the, uh, the, the current government is, is much to blame, I think. And I think that most Israelis would agree with me, as we saw. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are a number of organizations that uh, were, uh, I visited. Um, uh, I got some olive oil from a co-op that supports Palestinian farmers. Um, so if we want to do a, if you want to buy their olive oil, uh, I think they sell at Whole Foods. Um, I, I can figure that la out later. Uh, I didn't prepare anything for that. Um, the, a lot of the, um, there's not much economic support you can really do uh, because there's very little aid getting into Gaza and uh, that aid is already from governments, so it doesn't really matter. Um, I think the, probably the strongest thing to do is uh, contact representatives that you, you want a, a ceasefire uh, or you want whatever you, that you want. Um, the uh, United States is is the, the person who is at the top of this uh, conflict. Um, the, the our government is is the, the make or break for Israel. So um, how do we probably solve the issue? Pressure from the United States. Yeah, the, uh, Netanyahu is not popular. Um, and the unfortunate part uh, is that he's the one who controls these elections. So they can't even remove him if they wanted to. Um, and uh, he, he, will, he will, like what's gonna happen with that? It's, it's, it's reaching a boiling point, like internal conflict within the Israeli citizens. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't even know. I, I sort of like, like we all throw up our hands in the air and like they gotta figure it out. Um, They, so they're, they've never impeached anyone, so they don't really have like that as a precedent. Um, I think they're, they're approaching this impeachment process um, to, to remove him. Um, as they don't have elections every four years like we do. So it's not like there's a, a time limit for him for his term. Um, and that is the biggest issue, is that uh, he's the one who decides uh, when, when he goes. So that, that was why he was unpopular to begin with. Um, that's why he's being indicted uh, once he uh, loses power. Um, he tried to reform their constitution um, by uh, reducing the power of the justice system and increasing the power of the executive system. Um, everyone hated that um, <laughs> for a good reason. Um, they saw him trending towards that dictatorship position um, and they uh, uh, 
prevented him from changing the constitution, but he was really unpopular since then. Yes. So Ismail uh, Hania, the leader of Hamas, who was uh, assassinated in Tehran, um, <clears throat> he uh, was not super cooperative for peace negotiations. Um, I've heard uh, rumors about this, uh, the next person who replaces him, who might be more interested uh, in uh, peace. But this, uh, the other person is not even from Palestine. Um, so uh, Ismail is probably the best bet for caring about the Palestinian citizens who are dying. Um, so it, it, if, uh, you know, it's kind of up in the air, we don't know what's gonna happen yet. There's no, nothing, uh, you know, proven. Um, so uh, will, it, will it cause more strife? Uh, probably immediately. Uh, Iran is probably gonna retaliate. Uh, they'll send more missiles and drones um, and we'll have to see what happens. Um, so Iran is, is uh, Iran's a very large country, right? Um, so they, they are economically supporting Hamas entirely. Um, Hamas is not liked by anyone else. Um, and the, the, Hamas is, like I said before, uh, on the lower rungs of the, the hierarchy of being liked by uh, Iran. So they call it a proxy war. So these proxies, these Hezbollah, Houthis, Hamas, they're all funded by Iran. Um, so instead of Iran fighting the war against Israel themselves, it is these, these proxies that are fighting it. Um, and so uh, economic stuff comes from Iran, uh, and then they, they use that money they get to buy weapons from uh, a lot of different countries, um, primarily the Soviet Union, uh, or not the Soviet Union, Russia, uh, but like uh, a lot of old, old Soviet tech, uh, which Iran has all that old Soviet tech, um, and uh, China. Um, so they are smuggling it in through Egypt, um, through tunnel systems, uh, and that's how they're getting the weapons. Yeah? Uh, I did not. Um, I, the US government did not allow me to go into the Gaza Strip or into the West Bank. Um, the State Department said no Americans are allowed to travel there um, uh, without, without like great peril. Um, uh, a little dramatic phrasing, but um, so I wasn't able to see that. Um, there's actually been very few reporters who have been allowed to see that either. So um, the, the, the images aren't really coming across. Um, uh, so no, I wasn't able to see anything like that. I did not. Um, while I, I was over there, uh, the Christ at the Checkpoint conference was happening in Bethlehem. Um, I wasn't allowed to go in the West Bank though, so I didn't go. Um, but the, uh, I didn't. I didn't go. I didn't visit the Mennonites. I didn't visit uh, Bethlehem Bible College or anything like that. <laughs> that is the question. Um, and so if you if you had an opinion on that, you should write to your um, senators and your congressmen, and uh, you know uh, vote for people who um, uh, have different ideas. Uh, it's a little unfortunate that there um, aren't too many different ideas. It's actually not a bipartisan issue in the United States. Um, both Republicans and Democrats support um, uh, sending military aid to Israel uh, to pretty much the same extent. Um, so yeah. We're, we're coming in the middle of two cultures, and I'm not quite sure about that. Like, it's like, I don't know why we became involved, so involved taking one side over the other. So there's a, there's a large history to this. Um, the United States have been so supporting Israel since 1948, when Israel was founded. Um, 
Israel was founded uh, by uh, efforts uh, from the uh, UK. The UK had like owned the territory of Israel. They call it the Palestinian Mandate. Um, so the British controlled all of it. Um, and then uh, the Israeli Jews following mass emigration from Europe after the Holocaust um, went to Israel and they uh, decided that they want their own states. And so um, they fought for their independence, they won their states and the United States has been supporting them since then. Uh, the United States has uh, uh, you know, foreign policy, um, uh, diplomatic uh, interest in controlling, having influence over Israel. This is our foothold in the Middle East. Um, so if we want to have, if we want to deal and put pressure on Iran, uh, we got to support Israel. So that's, that's the sort of like the, the foreign policy behind that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's Iran, yeah. Um, so it, or again, the only thing we, we can do is write to our uh, elected officials, uh, put pressure on them. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's not much we can do economically. We can't send money to them really, um, uh, at least safely, we can't send money to anyone without getting scammed. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we can put a list together of, of places, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. That's how a lot of Israelis feel. Um, but the Palestinians, uh, they, their perspective is a little different. They think that um, uh, like they are in their own country. Um, they aren't going and attacking another country they're trying to uh, fend off foreign invaders. Um, so they are like, if you look at it just from a different perspective, they are fighting for their you know, revolution. They're, they're kicking off their oppressors. Um, and it's very similar to like the American revolution. We, we kicked it off the British. Um, that's, how, that's how they think about it. Um, so uh, I encourage just to you know, think about it from their perspective as well. I think we're good. It's yeah, it's a mess. Um, okay. <laughs> Yep, I'll be here.